I think you guys can see Holly. She is out here with me. Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the garden question and answer video that I do most Sundays. I'm shooting this video very early in the week. I've got some people coming into town for a uh, plant symposium that's in Raleigh. It's on Friday and Saturday. Uh, you guys will be seeing this video on Sunday, but that end of the week period of time, I've, again, I got some people flying in and other things. So I'm really looking forward, you know, as I'm shooting this to uh, uh, seeing some friends uh, from out of town. And this particular plant symposium, the last two times I was there, we met people that we ended up, you know, visiting later um, as part of the uh, channel. So uh, also kind of excited for that potential as well. The Learn to Garden video series, uh, I put up a list of all, I think not all, I can't, you can't possibly put up a list of all of, about, of, of what I'm about to say, uh, but I put up a list of 40 so far uh, garden pests uh, and photos with them and a little brief description, a couple sentences on you know what that little particular pest does. But if you're looking to identify pests in your garden, I made a quick kind of cheat sheet uh, thing. That's what went on the Learn to Garden video series this week. It's there's a discount uh, coupon down below the video for it. If you're interested, go over to the website. Uh, that's where it resides if, you, if you're interested. Thank you guys who have purchased the Learn to Garden video series. Uh, before you, um, you guys see this, I will have put up a couple more videos from Jay Sifford's beautiful garden up in West Jefferson, North Carolina, and also one from Jeremy's uh, and Megan's uh, beautiful garden, um, which has, I think it has a Raleigh address actually, but it's way down, way in the par su southern part of the city. It's a great, it's a fantastic garden uh, with uh, stone, a lot of stonework in it. And I had put up some previous videos with the stonework from that garden as well. If you want to go back and look at those, uh, Jer Jeremy's always great to have on the channel. And the kind of master tour is coming of, from this place. It's going to be broken down into several videos, but we're going through and just kind of going through everything out here in the garden and talking about you know how things have uh, each individual plant has uh, responded in the one two three years it's been in the uh, in the ground out here so those videos are coming up okay let's jump into some questions um somebody asked if i have heard of a patriot holly yes i have that one's there's one over at the uh the jc ralston arboretum actually it's not a real common one i don't see a lot of people growing it but it is a uh uh um, I, I'm, I'm familiar with it. Um, it's got a really nice, shiny, dark green uh, leaf on it. And then they said they have one and it's thin after 15 years, uh, but there oaks, there's an oak not that far from it. It's not in the shade, it's in the sun, but there's an, there is an oak that's not that far from it. Could that be keeping it thin or why would it be thin or is this holly just in general thin? No, it grows pretty thick. Um, I don't think they had compared it to Nellie Stevens, and not a lot of things grow as thick as Nellie Stevens hollies do without doing any work to them at all. Uh, but it's, the one over at the Ralston is very thick. It's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a great looking plant, so it's got to be something going on there, whether it's, uh, you know, it hasn't been watered enough or it's gotten too much water or the roots from that tree are inhibiting it in some way or needed fertilizer along the way or it's gotten, you know, something, something's gone on. But um, you can shear it fertilize it make sure it's in its own it's got its own bed space I mean, you know or make sure it's not in you know long i don't know if you've got grass growing up to it or something like that i don't know i mean i'm just getting a question and then i'm guessing you know as to what might be slowing it down but sometimes folks will put shrubs or trees directly into their lawn and you know the lawn uh is pretty good at competing with them okay so somebody has black ants uh on a black walnut and a couple other trees uh, and wanted to know what could be going on there. If you see a lot of ant traffic going up and down trunks of trees, especially this time of year, a lot of times that can mean there's aphids potentially, potentially in the tree. Uh, the ants will go up and uh, they like the honeydew secretion from the aphids and they will, uh, you know, they're attracted to that. I have had some, a few aphids on the grapevine over here last year. And of course there's just ants, you know, the ants are basically farming the aphids, you know, to get the little honeydew secretion. Uh, the secretion, their, their aphid poo uh, is sweet and that's what the ants are after. Um, you know, I, I just don't worry about it overall. These things have a way of balancing out in a healthy garden system uh, and the ants definitely aren't doing any, any damage here. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, so somebody asked me, uh, oh, oh, somebody asked me my opinion 
of water meters. I always talk about just checking a plant with my finger, digging down a couple inches to see if it's moist or if it needs water. They ask me my opinion of water meters versus checking it with my finger. Whatever works for you. I mean, I'm, I'm sure those, you know, water meters, I'm sure are accurate. Uh, I tend, I, my relationship with tools is I have a lot of them, but I use very few of them. <laughs> and that's another video that's just gone up recently was the, uh, I think before last week's Q&A on Saturday was the five tools that uh, Steph and I just kind of never put away. It was actually about eight things we showed, nine things we showed. Uh, there's probably just a few more things than that that uh, stay out here all the time. And then I have got a shed full of tools that I don't use all that much because by the time I go and find the water meter, <laughs> you know, if I don't have it right there ready to go uh, wherever I am in the garden, you know, but I could have already checked it with my finger and watered it. So totally accurate if you don't trust yourself or you're new to gardening or something like that and you're in and you're you know just nervous about it in general yeah use the water meter you know check check it with check it with one of those they're inexpensive i'll link one down uh, below this video that um, but again once you a lot of this is just being comfortable you know overall holly wants to go inside so i'm going to let her in real quick Steph is in there cooking and she's obsessed with staring at it. She's wishing it into her mouth is what she's wants is what she's doing. Uh, so somebody just made a question that said, I want a similar garden, uh, I guess to what they saw in last week's Q and A video. What do I need to do? There's a playlist on the channel called new house and every almost, I'm sure I've missed a couple along the way, but every video, from this garden is in that playlist uh, called New House. And so you can go back and see how it was created uh, video by video. Um, that's about the best I can tell you, but every, I haven't hidden anything. Um, everything's been documented uh, here on YouTube. So somebody asked if the lantern fly is in North Carolina yet. Yes, but I haven't seen it here yet. I've been, uh, I was up in, I have been up to Wilmington, Delaware once and up to Philadelphia once in the last few years. And, you know, just saw them everywhere up there. It's incredible, um, you know, how, how many of them there are. They're going to come here too. Uh, I expect, you know, over even maybe by the time they ever get here uh, that, you know, things are going to figure them out, that they can eat them and that they can, you know, uh, you know, I know that I've, se I've seen some video of some mantises eating them. Uh, so, you know, uh, that and spiders eating them and a few birds, you know, cardinals, you know, and I have a feeling if you have an insect that's that over populated, you know, that's just breeding freely and it's going everywhere, the birds or insects that take advantage of that, almost all of their young are going to live because there's so much abundant food source. And so they're going to pass that down pretty quickly, but that's going to take several generations. Uh, for that to happen. So that's what I'm hoping happens is that we see uh, the insects and the birds figure it out. You know, they just never seen them before, so they may not see them as a food source. Hoping they will. And then again, like I say, if you have, you know, every bird that figures this out, every mother bird or that figures this out, and she's able to get more of her young out into the world, then the more quicker they're going to figure it out. So that, that's what I'm hoping you know, happens. And again, I've seen some mantises eating them and that kind of thing. So I'm guessing the prey and mantis population will just, you know, explode for the ones that, you know, know that they're a food source uh, and will eat them. Uh, in the meantime, I think you got to, uh, you know, they're, t they're advising people to, you know, knock them off, you know, t get in, when they're in the larva stage on the trees to knock them into a bag with ammonia or something like that. You may want to look that up, but uh, again, we just haven't had them here yet. Uh, but I'm hoping that they'll just be figured out you know, over, over, over a certain amount of time. Let's see, uh, unfortunately for people that do, you know, grapes and fruits and, you know, those kinds of things, it's pretty devastating. It's pretty devastating for people who make a living off the crops that those lantern flies are damaging. Somebody had spider mites on some asters. Uh, they're taking my advice. And if something in the garden is driving them crazy, they're going to get rid of them. Uh, they want to know if they can replant something else immediately. Yes. My, but my only concern would be, you know, what made those asters vulnerable to mites? 
uh, in the first place because spider mites are definitely on this planet to destroy unhealthy plants. That is, the per that is the sole purpose of them. You want to get spider mites, you take a plant inside that needs a lot of sunlight and you put it in a kind of a semi-dark window inside um, and you, you'll quickly find out how fast you get spider mites. If you, you take a conifer that's zone five to seven and you put it down in zone eight B and you get spider mites. I mean, that's the stressing plants, you know, is the way you get spider mites. So that would be my only concern is what's going on there. Is it an area that stays too wet or too dry or are you over fertilizing? Are you, you know, there's some other component to why the, the why they had, um, uh, you know, why they had mites in the first place. And so whatever you put back in that space, you know, be thinking about, you know, what it is, what it is that got that, the last plant so stressed out. Okay, so somebody asked, is it too late to prune Pieris japonica? And what I would say is no, but we do reach a point sometime around the middle of summer where I will stop pruning. Uh, you definitely want to be, not be pruning things that bloom in the winter like Pieris or Azaleas, you know, after you know, sometime about now. Actually, I'm going to say it's mid-June, probably. when That gives them enough time to put on a flush of growth, set the flower buds, and get that growth semi-hardened off or hardened off before it goes into winter. So sometime around the middle of the uh, month to maybe the 4th of July would be the very, very end of the time that you could be pruning on those winter flowering or early spring flowering shrubs. Um, okay, so somebody... Ask, I got a couple people just in general ask about what I think about rain barrels or using rain barrels. Uh, if, as long as they're legal in your area, they're banned in some states or some counties, uh, you know, for various, for various reasons. Uh, but here we can use rain barrels. I don't have a rain barrel here. I actually don't have gutters on this house. We're in the process of remodeling it. It's that, pro that project's actually starting July 10th uh, is when the project on remodeling the outside of this house is happening. Uh, and when it, um, after, after that happens and we do gutter this house, I probably will put in rain barrels. In the meantime, we have two carts, <laughs> which we park under the overhang over here on the back of the house. And we do collect that water and we'll use, we'll scoop the water out of that and do our containers. So we do, we are collecting water in a similar fashion. You do have to be, uh, one of the per people asked about mosquitoes. Yeah, there are, you know, you're going to, you have stagnant water in anything. You're, you have the potential you know, if mosquitoes can get in, you know, to it, that they will, uh, you know, they love stagnant water. There is a, you can put a very fine mesh over the hole in the top of, of the rain barrel so that it's small enough that the water can go through, but a mosquito can't get in uh, to lay, to lay um, in the water. And then, of course, you can use those mosquito dunks uh, as well if you want to do that. But yeah, you do run the risk of having mosquitoes from any stagnant water. Uh, but yeah, I'm a big proponent of collecting water uh, from, you know, from, you know, from rainwater. And again, I think rainwater is the best overall water for your garden uh, anyway. And it's free. Uh, let's see. Um, so somebody has a lilac in zone 7B in New Mexico, and it only gets a few blooms each year. So again, I don't know what kind of lilac it is, but my, my overall guess in zone 7B is you're not getting enough cold on it uh, in the winter time to... Uh, you know, for it to, uh, to thrive uh, the way it should. But again, uh, any, kind of these, any of those kinds of questions, I'm just guessing. I don't know if it's in enough sun, if it's getting enough water. You know, there's a lot of things could go into that. I don't know if it's, you know, happy in a mulched bed, if it grows vigorously and still doesn't bloom. You know, um, if it grows vigorously and still doesn't bloom, it's maybe a cold issue. Uh, but again, I'm, I'm always just guessing at a lot of these, uh, a lot of these things. Oh, so somebody has a, a small lot and just nothing thrives. They plant lots and lots of things and just everything is just kind of, you know, stagnant. Uh, you know, you don't, just don't get a lot of growth on anything. Um, not a lot happening. And then in the same question, they did say they had several uh, maples in the garden and they are hard to garden with. You know, I say this all the time and I say it in consultations. I op open up photos that somebody sent me for a consultation and I see two maples that were planted in a garden that they're just moving into and I immediately tell them to tear them out uh, while they still can and plant an oak or plant some other native uh, shade tree because I'm a big fan of shade trees. I think we don't plant enough shade trees. We plant way too many ornamental trees. Uh, and if I wasn't surrounded by them here, 
uh, giant shade trees, I would have considered putting one in this garden, but I just don't need to because this lot's completely surrounded by uh, giant shade trees, you know, out just out from a distance all the way around this property. Uh, but maples, you know, especially red, you know, red maples are really, really hard. Silver maples are too. Uh, very, very hard to, uh, to garden with. The roots just run wild. They have the surface roots that are big, and then they have this fibrous root system. If you ever try to dig around the base of one and plant something, it's this really weird fibrous root system that just runs everywhere. Uh, that front garden out there where we took down the maple, took down the maple, turned the wood into wood chips, uh, had the stump ground and had the stump ground well, we're still dealing with it though. There's roots out there everywhere from that maple and there will be for a long, long time. They don't have, you know, they're buried under the ground. There's not a lot of oxygen, you know, to, to, for them to break down very quickly. Somebody asked if, uh, if rubber mulch is bad uh, for your plants. And this is, I'm gonna give you a two part answer for the rubber mulch, okay? So is, uh, and you can answer it for yourself. I mean, really, I mean, you know, everybody's free to do what they want to. Rubber is organic. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's organic. It is, there are chemicals in it though to stabilize it. Some of those are organic. Some of the chemicals they use to, you know, to, 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 to stabilize it and to rearrange the, the way in which the rubber is bound together. Uh, you know, those, uh, uh, there are a lot of there, there are there are a lot of chemicals that are used for that for that vulcanizing. Gosh, I couldn't come up with the word for vulcanizing rubber. Uh, some of again, some of those you know, uh, not all of those are bad. Uh, it's just there, but there are a lot of ingredients that go into rubber outside of the, just the natural material. But here's the two things I would think about. Number one, because it breaks down so slowly. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's not really going to do anything to help feed your plants or feed your soil or, you know, improve your soil. So you basically you're suspending soil improvement, you know, by using rubber mulch. Uh, it will hold moisture in place. It will probably help you prevent some weeds, although weed seeds are going to drop on top of it like anything else eventually. Uh, it's going to settle. It's going to seem like it's settling over time as debris and stuff blows in on top of it. So at some point you're going to have weeds in it. It just may be, it's much longer than, than other mulches. So you're not improving your soil, number one. Number two, because it is organic, uh, it will break down over some period of time. And so the sun is going to break it down. Uh, the microbes in the soil are going to break it down in the other direction. It breaks down much, 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 much slower. But those chemicals that are in it that I talked about, are going to be released into your soil. Some probably okay and some uh, maybe not. I, I, do, I just, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm just telling you, you're not improving your soil and uh, it will break down in time and whatever that rubber is made of will be released into the soil. So again, um, you know, I leave these, leave these things up for you, to, you guys to decide, but that's my two thoughts uh, on rubber mulch. So somebody has a pink velour crepe myrtle and says it, they prune about four inches of it off in the winter, and that's about all the growth it puts back on uh, in the summer. Uh, and he wanted to know if he should just stop pruning it, you know, to, you know, it, maybe he's pruning it too much, and maybe that's the stress. That's not the stress at all. I mean, crepe myrtles get absolutely butchered around here and come back and grow six or eight feet, uh, sometimes more in a single season after that crepe murder that people do to them. Uh, so that's that's not going to be it. The pruning you're doing on it's not going to be it. I think about anytime I have a plant that's not growing, and I've answered a couple other questions on here about because it could be tree root related if there's something else in the area that's causing an issue. Uh, you know, I start asking myself, is it just staying too dry in that space? You know, if that's the case, that could be an issue. Uh, is it staying too wet? You would have other foliage issues probably if it was staying too wet. Uh, with nutrient deficiencies and that kind of thing. So I think you'd pick that out real quick uh, if it was staying too wet, but it could be staying too dry. And then lastly, and one that I see most often when the plant is just not thriving and it's not some kind of root competition or something, is that it was planted too deep. Uh, and it could have been, it may not even been you that planted it too deep. It could have been the nursery taking it from one size container into another and just strangling it. So, you know, look down at the base of it and see if you see any kind of flare, you know, 
with any kind of tree, whether it's a small tree, big tree, whatever, I'm looking at my palm over here behind the camera. It even has a little flare. Right before it goes into the ground, you'll see, it, you should see, you know, the trunk coming down and then a slight expansion near the soil. If you see the thing goes into the soil just straight without any kind of flare, that flare is under the ground somewhere. And so it may have been planted too deep, but that's frequently, really frequently what I see, or mulch volcanoes, uh, you know, all the trees around here in commercial developments where the landscapers are piling mulch up on them, I see tons of stress in those trees and just very, very little growth in them. You see a lot of cracking. You know, you, you seem to get more of that winter cracking, you know, down near the bases and things like that on those trees that are overly stressed. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm thinking it could be planted poorly. And a lot of times, again, I'm not telling it's you that did it. You may have done, you may have done it, but, but it could have been done you know, in the process, you know, I used to root cuttings that I sold in 50 cell trays to a guy who did one gallon trade gallon material or full gallon material. And then they sold them to a place that did three or five or seven gallon trees and sent them out. So each of those times that plant was being sold from the time I rooted it to the time the customer put it in the ground or the landscaper put it in the ground, it had a lot of opportunities to be misplanted. So there you go. Uh, Let's see, somebody planted three all gold junipers and one is browning out some. They're confident that it's not overwatering because they're up on a little bit of a mound. I mean, it could have been underwatered. I mean, that's just, you know, you know, junipers as drought tolerant as they are, you know, everything has a limit. And conifers are terrible at letting us know they're dry. They just turn brown, lose needles, thin out. They, you know, uh, they react. Uh, they react very poorly without having let, let us know. If you know what to look for, you know, I, I mean, I've been doing this long enough that I can walk past a juniper or I can walk past a conifer and kind of tell what it looks like when it's dry. But I think just for the most part, it's very difficult uh, to detect. Whereas leafy plants, you know, leafy plants will just, you know, they'll wilt, right? And they'll let you, hey, I'm over here. I need some water and conifers don't. So um that could have been it uh that it got dry or you just you know sometimes you just buy a bad plant uh you know or, or a plant i mean another, they ask if it could be phytophthora root rot but part of their question said they knew they weren't overwatering it so the only way it could be phytophthora probably would be as if it came with phytophthora root rot meaning it was overwatered at the garden center or nursery uh, before you got it so that's a possibility but it wouldn't probably you know um Usually those kinds of things show up kind of, you know, pretty slow. You know, if you were going to put a shrub in the ground and then kill it by overwatering it, that's probably going to take a little while uh, to show up uh, and not show up immediately. Uh, so again, you may have just bought a dud uh, or drastically, uh, drastically overdid the I don't want to overwater it uh, and underwatered it. Okay. Can a plant, okay. So can a can a plant that is hardy in your zone be damaged if it's not dormant? Uh, yes, definitely. I mean, we saw a lot of that in December. Uh, we had a lot of things in this garden. I had things blooming in this garden in December. That we just had a weird fall where just nothing went to sleep. So even the most hardy of the most hardy of things uh, in this garden had the potential to be damaged going into a. It was 60 degrees in the morning, and it was a. 13, uh, you know, five hours later. Uh, it was kind of it was an absolute crazy event that happened there in December. And so, yes, um, no matter how hardy a plant is, if it's not asleep when the freeze comes, you know, it, it can be whacked. Uh, it can be whacked pretty hard. And then somebody, then they ask, can you make them go dormant? That's probably, you know, fairly unlikely. Now you can, if you have plants that are vulnerable to this or more vulnerable to this or plants that you you know, are less likely to go to sleep on time. Butterfly bushes are actually in that group that are just, you know, they're unlike, they just don't want to go to sleep. And then they get hurt bad. They're, they have a difficult time growing butterfly bushes south of here. Even though they're wicked cold hardy, the problem with them is that they actually just don't go to sleep and then they get cold and then they get, because there's water in the stem, it freezes from the inside out and cracks them open and breaks them and kills them. And so, the, you know, kind of, kind of an interesting thing. You can, you know, not have them in the, you know, in the sunlight, 
you know, at that time of year. You could put it in some space where it wasn't getting as much sunlight and that would probably shut it down, you know, uh, if it's in the sunlight all day long, that area is keeping heat. Like if you had something, take that same butterfly bush and put it up against a brick wall on the south side of your house. You know, it may, it's probably gonna take a couple more weeks for that butterfly bush to go to sleep. It could be any number of plants. I'm just keep saying butterfly bush. Uh, you know, you know, having it up against a brick wall might keep it awake a little bit longer. So, but the answer to your, to, to your original question is, yes, any plant and truly any plant, no matter how cold hardy it is, uh, needs to be in the process of going to sleep before, you know, 10 degrees wax it over the head, uh, for sure. Somebody said, are crepe myrtles invasive? They have root suckers coming up from their neighbor's crepe myrtle. So if their neighbor's cut doing the crepe myrtle thing on top of them, they are probably forcing root suckers up everywhere. I mean, any, I mean, that is an invasive quality of, you know, for, especially as you, as the neighbor who's, you know, having to cut these things out. Uh, every year, but overall, uh, crepe myrtles aren't considered invasive. They are on like the national invasive list, but they're on the mild. I think they're in the mild uh, category. They do occasionally reseed themselves, but um, and that's going to obviously be very much variety dependent on which ones ca are capable of reseeding themselves. Uh, but for the most part, I don't go anywhere and see you know a crepe myrtle forest anywhere. Um, they're, they're pretty tame in that way, but the root suckers are annoying. Let's don't call it invasive, we'll call them super, super annoying. Somebody has two Indian hawthorns and they have leaf spot uh, issues. Uh, and this is true with a lot of older Indian hawthorn varieties. There are actually new ones uh, that are less likely to get it. They wanted to know if they could limb them up and get some air movement under it. Would that help? Probably not, unfortunately. A lot of these uh, uh, old, dwarf Indian hawthorn varieties have really succumbed to it very badly. And, uh, you know, I don't, I really don't think they're salvageable. Every time I see one, I'm thinking it needs to go and I probably would, but there are that, uh, clean sweep snowbank series. I have one in the front garden is clean, 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 just absolutely amazing how clean that plant is. So it was selected, uh, for this leaf spot issue and it's a beautiful plant, uh, bloomed well, great dark green foliage. Indian hawthorns, for those of you who don't know, are in the rose family, and the rose family is notorious for uh, disease problems. You know, my amelanchier, my service berry out front's in that family. A lot of things in this garden are in the uh, rose family. I've done a video on uh, the Lamiaceae or the mint family and the Asteraceae, the Aster family. And thank you guys again for continuing to buy those ACA uh, shirts. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. I'm going to do a video um, on the rosaceae as well. And I actually have a lot of members of the rosaceae in this, in this garden, but a lot of the fruit you eat, a lot of just, there's a lot of plants and commercially the rose family is an extremely important family of plants uh, for humans. And, you know, either from ornamental plants or from our diets, uh, it's a very important, uh, very important plant family. So I will, I'll do that video soon. And I like, to, I actually like doing those videos and I just remembering that I did those two videos now and I haven't done any more. Uh, but that, that's, that's one that I'll do, but I would pull those Indian hawthorns out. That's just my call on them. I mean, you can try to limb them up. You can try to do something else. You can try to make sure you're cleaning the leaves that are falling off of them out from under it. But I think you're just gonna have an ongoing issue. You can replace them with one of the disease resistant ones or take as an opportunity uh, to find something uh, that you enjoy even more. Um, so I had mentioned about distressed plants being vulnerable uh, to insect issues and disease issues. And the person, person made a you know, question about it asking why. They understood disease issues, didn't understand the insect issues. There was a person who uh, answered it <laughs> probably incredibly concisely. Uh, so I really appreciate that. If you go back and you guys want to read that, uh, that answer, it was great. But it's... Um, um, Plants release uh, VOCs or volatile organic compounds. These are signals that they send out for, to get pollinators to come to plants or get um, any kind of issues that they're having or needs that they're having. They can do it through their roots, through, you know, and, and, and talk to the living uh, soil biome uh, down below. They can communicate with each other. Uh, lot, lots of things that we know and don't know about this, uh, but we learn, lear, learn, learning more. There is a communication going on. Some of that communication can be uh, received 
by insects is a problem with that plant. Uh, healthy plants, this is not true of all insects, okay, but some of our chewing insects cannot eat healthy plant material. They cannot digest it, okay? The world, you know, this is, otherwise they'd wipe out all the plants on the planet. <laughs> so, you know, a lot, spider mites are, you know, on, the, on that list, but a lot, lot of them have to be the plant has to be in some sort of vulnerable position. It almost has to be on the way to being uh, rotting already. You know, it's sending out a signal. An, um, you know, ammonia is one of the um, smells and, you know, that some insects pick up on. Uh, but the plant has to be in some sort of decline. They, can, they, they're, they, are, they literally cannot digest healthy plant material some insects but anyway that that's the reason um and again the those those insects or um can read you know or they're they're reading those vocs okay um it's one of those complex things it's something i've actually worked on and learned about since i was 21 22 years old uh it's it's something i've always always been interested in uh it's you know it's one of those things that uh it's hard to explain. It's hard, it, you know. It's it's, it's easier to. Uh, it, it's hard to explain. But the, the more time you spend in gardening, the more you'll see that healthy systems with lots and lots of species, and that can be from birds, you know, down to earthworms, you know, and then all the plant species all together. Yeah, you know, you'll see less issues. Not that there are no issues. The issues are actually here. They just never get out of control. Somebody had a seven foot tall osmanthus, wanted to know if they could transplant it. Yes, absolutely, but I would cut it back some uh, before you do. If you can go back and look, uh, I did a video on moving a very big camellia at the old house. People say you can't move, you know, they, they don't say you can't move, but they say it's hard to move camellias. And I showed this technique on what was a plant that most people would consider a plant that really doesn't want to be moved. And I just cut the thing back hard. I root pruned it. I left it in place for a few weeks. Then I moved it. Everything went totally smooth, no problem at all. Just follow that technique. Uh, let's see. And then, uh, last question. Uh, somebody asked about how the heck do you water in the summer? And then a lot of people had uh, liked that question, so it got voted up uh, pretty high. When summer watering, to me, is the least tricky time <laughs> to water because I know it's the, it's the time of year that it's much harder to overwater. Uh, and so, you know, I have less pro I have less problem reading it in the summertime. Uh, I so for me, containers. You know, the the more the further we get into the summer, the containers that we've put in in the last few weeks and videos went up for them. The containers are going to require more and more and more and more water by August. They're probably going to need water every day. You know, between now and then, I might be able to skip a day here or there. So that, you know, that's containers. When I water containers, I let the water run all the way. I let the water flush out of the bottom of the container a bit, okay, because I want to wash any salts, you know, that can build up uh, in the container. And then I don't water it till it needs water. Again, it's going to need more and more and more and more times watering throughout the summer. My older established shrubs, anything that's been in the ground for two or three years at this point, it's way down the list of things for me to... Uh, to water unless I'm observing that they're in some sort of wilt. I stress plants a little bit more. You know, um, Steph can get a little more nervous about it. I've, just, I've done this for so long that I don't mind stressing the plants a little bit. You know, I've seen plants in stress. I've gotten in a pickup truck, drove away from them and came back the next morning and the stress isn't there anymore. And it's because the sun went down and the stress was actually more related to it being 95 degrees and the roots not being able to get water up to the top of the plant fast enough. It wasn't that there wasn't water in the soil. It was that the engine, you know, can't work fast enough on certain days of the year. And so sometimes just walking away late in the day and seeing occasionally what will happen overnight. Does it respond? Does it, re, you know, does it come back? Does it come back out of that? So I stress plants a little bit. My, uh, I'll take, if it doesn't, okay, so we get an inch, we average about an inch of rain a week here during the year. We don't get it all on the week after week after week. So if we go a week, you know, at this point, if we go three or four days without watering, I will come out here and I'll water the annual borders 
and I'll water them pretty thoroughly. You know, I'll make sure that you know I'm, I'm, I'm watering them enough that the water soaks in. My shrubs would have to go longer than that, at least a week, uh, maybe even into a second, the start of a second week for sure, before I would consider doing any watering on them. The things like this lower petal and behind me that have been in the ground even longer, it's not getting any water from me unless it's overflow from me watering something else. Uh, it's not getting anything. Uh, so that's kind of that's kind of it. I water the containers just based on, you know, you can feel the weight of them. You can put your finger down in them. You can see the color change, you know, on the soil. The annuals are probably getting water every third or fourth day very thoroughly. The shrubs, I want to push them as much as possible because the, I want them to go out and w work for water a bit, right? If they don't go out and work for it, how are they ever going to be independent of you? I've, I've dug stuff up 10 years after it was in the ground and had it be in the same kind of root ball that it was when it went in the ground because the person had it on their, their uh, irrigation for their lawn was on their shrubs as well. And it watered the shrub like every other day, you know, every other day for years and years and years and the plant never rooted in. So I'm stressing them uh, just a bit. When you water, water thoroughly. I think that's the key uh, to over, overall watering success is to water very thoroughly and water the whole area. You know, I don't stand here and water a plant just right at its base. The roots are out in a, the bigger surrounding area. And again, I want to tempt the plants to get roots out into that surrounding area. And the only way to do that is to have water outside the surrounding area. So I will water the whole thing very thoroughly when we water. So, you know, every day on the containers, every third, fourth day on the annuals, Every week, I'm probably checking the less mature shrubs, the older shrubs. They'd have to go a lot longer than that before I, uh, before I watered them. So much of my watering, um, so much of the ease of maintenance in this garden was the initial soil prep that I did. I can't say that enough. I can't say that enough. There's, you know, three inches of organic material here on the top, and every time it rains or every time I water, every drop is going down in the ground and most of it's you know in a, in a place where the plant can use it right if it if it hits the top and runs off and sheets off your property you know that's water that you're now going to have to you know spend money on from a water hose or you know well water or whatever you're doing you're you're still spending money on electricity you're going to have to water those things uh, but I'll, I'll make a video. I do have a video on the, on the channel about watering during the summertime. If you want to go back and uh, take a look at it, I do talk uh, more thoroughly in that video, but I'm actually harder on plants than you guys would think. I think if you look at this garden and go, wow, it's so lush. You must be watering all the time. I'm not, not watering as much as you think I am. Uh, the soil prep that we did initially is keeping us from having to do that so thank you guys for following along with the channel i'll be back next week uh, with a question and answer video ask your questions down in the comment section and i'll pick from those next week